Okay, good morning. We're going to start off with a little bit of prayer here real quick. And then we'll jump right into the notes. Um, I was blessed this past weekend. Um, I had a brother in the Lord um, over in Ireland actually contact me. I did some uh, website design for him uh, once upon a time. And... Um, I helped him do some uh, some email setup and everything. And at the very end of the conversation and uh, uh, the phone call, he's talking to each other back and forth over Ireland for about two hours. And uh, at the very end of it, he just kind of said, uh, "Brother, would you just keep me in prayer?" He says, I'm, "I've been struggling just in my own relationship with God." He says, "I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again, and I, I don't have any issues with those." He just says, "I just kind of feel distant, like I'm kind of moving away from where I should be and different things." And he says, would you keep me in prayer? And I said, absolutely. I'd be happy to keep you in prayer for that. But um, I said, it might be relevant to your interest. I just happen to be teaching on that right now. And the whole reason, he says, there's just a small little hiccup with his website and just made him contact me to start with. And I said, I just pointed him at our church website. And I said, uh, um, I just happen to be teaching about relationship with God right now. And I said, uh, just some basic things that uh, most Christians need to do or just kind of need to start doing again. And I said, it's something I've uh, taken out of my own experience in life, and you might find it relevant. Well, by the end of the conversation, he'd gone up on YouTube, and he'd already started watching the first of the lessons, so praise God. So he'll be watching uh, this lesson as well. So good morning, Eche. <laughs> so praise God. Um, I, I, I love this class um, because this is, this is something that everyone needs. Uh, this is something that... Uh, Every Christian needs and anybody that's wanting to become a Christian, they're going to kind of need to know that it's not always uh, because of ourselves and the world we live in. It's not always, you know, sunshine and roses. Is that sometimes we need to kind of do a little bit of effort on our own part, just kind of get back in line where we need to be and reconnect with God sometimes. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer before I just start preaching here. Father God, I come to you in the mighty name of your dear son, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the word that's going to go forth. And we thank you above all else that your spirit, your words, your teaching, and what you would have this class be and this lesson become this morning uh, just shines forth above and beyond my words, Lord. Just uh, your spirit to illuminate the word of God in the hearts and minds and souls of those that are going to watch uh, both here and later on on the internet. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, praise God. Okay, we are on Lesson 7 of Relationship with God, and we're talking this morning about two different kind of uh, main points on my little, my little uh, top 20 list there. And again, like I said, and I say this in every class, these are notes that I actually developed for myself because of just a situation, kind of a dry spot of where I was feeling just a few years ago, about five or six years ago when I was over in Ireland, serving God full time and loving God and loving church and loving life. But every once in a while, you kind of get so busy doing everything else, you kind of forget there's some things you're supposed to keep doing uh, to, to keep any kind of relationship going. So we're using kind of some natural examples and we're using biblical examples at the same time just to kind of refresh you about the things that every believer should be doing to some degree. And these are things that have helped me since that time. And these are things that I've been able to help share uh, with other people, just kind of help keep them on track. And it's not that you're off track or anything like that, but um, in, in any relationship, sometimes if we don't focus enough on the other person, we're the ones that feel distant. Maybe they don't feel that way. I mean, God's always talking to us, always trying to lead us and guide us. And He's always there and ever ready, present uh, help in times of need, the Bible says. But sometimes we kind of tend to drift off. So... The uh, point here this morning is talking about just refocusing. Um, when you focus on something, you set your sights on it. I mean, uh, if I'm, I'm looking at the poster in the back of the wall, it says the, the Lion of Judah, and all of a sudden my entire attention is on there. I'm looking at the lion, I'm looking at the mane, and I can see the whole, whole detail, but all of a sudden everything else that I'm not looking at kind of goes a little fuzzy, and I'm focusing, and all my attention's all of a sudden on that poster, and that's what happens when you focus on something, you're putting your attention on it. But what we tend to do in the things of life especially, and we'll be getting to this in the notes as well, but what we tend to do is we tend to look at just certain things, and we get in the habit of just looking at those certain things. And the Bible continually tells us different things like in the Old and the New Testament, you know, lift up your eyes. Where does your help come from? Your help comes from the Lord. And we often uh, look at the circumstances, we look at the situations, and we don't always remember that He's on our side, He's there, He's ready to help us, and in our relationship time with Him, we just need to learn how to focus on Him. So the the um, first point here is refocus. When you have to focus on something, 
Um, it's usually because you lost sight of it at some point. The point of focusing or refocusing as a Christian on God and the things of God is an exercise to keep your attention on what is truly important in life. Now, we all know we're Christians. Okay, we're Christians. You're supposed to focus on the Lord. And it's not a religious exercise because there's other religions that focus on what they believe in. But in Christianity, it's focusing on the relationship that you have with Him. It is a very real, very active, and very uh, um, relatable and uh, uh, relevant relationship that you have with God. Um, I was just sharing there a few minutes ago how I'm, I'm talking to one of my coworkers at the current job I have at the moment, and one of the things we talked about in the conversation is he says, well, I've, I've, I've realized that faith is something special, and I've realized that faith is something that, that is not just, you know, an everyday thing. He says, but I don't know if I, I'm ready for that step yet to actually, you know, take a step of faith and actually start uh, trusting in God and ask for salvation and all this sort of thing. And I said, well, uh, let's back up a bit. And I, I talked to him. I said, uh, you, you do believe there is a God or at least the possibility of God? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I said, the step before uh, that is, uh, if you believe that there is a God, a possibility of a God, is He big enough or is God big enough to be able to talk? If He, if he created all of this and the, the elaborate construction of the world, and can He communicate to some degree with, with you, with me, with anybody? Well, yeah, I believe that's a possibility too. I said, okay, have you tried talking to Him? And He says, what? And I said, talk to God. If you believe that there's a possibility of God out there, Talk to God and ask Him to reveal Himself to you, show Himself to you. It's one of the things I did in my early walk with God. And he says, I have never thought of that before. He says, I'm not ready to take the step of salvation, but I never even thought about just saying, hey, if you're there, can you make yourself real to me? And that's the first step in a relationship that he's about to take, and he doesn't realize that the moment that you actually seek God, the Bible says, seek God and you shall find Him. Ask and you shall find, you know, seek and, or knock and it shall be open. All these scriptures tell you as soon as you actually start putting your heart towards God, He's going to be there and He's all, already there waiting and just, hey, there you are. Come on in. Take the next step. There we go. And He's, he's at the very next step. So He's just starting the very first step of relationship with God. But the main thing that He needs to learn how to do is what we've talked about all along. Just talk to Him. Speak up. Say, God, if you're there, I need you. And there's been times in Christianity and in uh, the common man's life that we all need to sit there and go, you know, God, I just feel so distant, like my brother and over in Ireland. Uh, I feel so distant. I just, I just really just want to know that you're there and know that you're real. And I just want to be able to just, just feel you again, to, to know you're there and just, you know, become even more real. And I, so I told this to my, my friend at work, and he's about to take that first step, and I'm absolutely thrilled. I spent two or three hours in the parking lot till about one or two in the morning, you know, just witnessing to him, and it was absolutely fabulous. And he was kind of quiet to me the next day, but he was still talkative and things like that, but he didn't really touch on some things. So uh, I just took opportunity just to bless him and kind of keep in contact with him and, you know, see what we can do from there. But anyway, back to my notes. Uh, your life, my life, all of us, we're all here ultimately to know God, to know Him, and help others know Him as well. Without this thought continually in our hearts and our minds, we'll focus on other things, as if they're more important than God. The Bible says, Magnify the Lord, Psalms 34, 2 through 4. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. Now there's a few things there and, just, and this is just a Psalms and it's just an exhortation uh, in the Old Testament, but it's talking about how my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. When you boast in the Lord, it's when you're telling other people about how good He is, what He's done for you, and what He's doing for you. Uh, the humble shall hear thereof. That's, that's literally speaking to other people about what God is doing for you and how He'll do the same thing for them. And it says, let us magnify the Lord with, oh, oh magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. And it talks about there, there's, there's worship, praise and worship, and there's fellowship that comes along with that. And it talks about the fact that this time, this is one of the David Psalms, this time he sought the Lord, and just like all the times before, God delivered him from his problems. So the Bible actually uses this expression several times in the Scriptures. Ultimately, the act of magnifying something, and I apologize, we're going to get into some definitions, but the act of magnifying something is when you're looking at something and it just seems to get bigger to you. And all of a sudden, you just put your focus on it. And like, if I'm not looking at that poster we used a, as an example a little while ago, it, it seems less important. If I put my focus on the, uh, the poster, all of a sudden, the importance is there. 
Now there's the, the putting your focus on it and there's also the act of magnifying. And when you magnify something, it just becomes bigger. And in praise and worship or in your time with God, if you just spend time just worshiping Him, He will become bigger and bigger and bigger in your sight. And did his, did his size change at all? No. But your attention that you're giving Him all of a sudden puts more importance and more value on Him. And it's literally you, your soul, realizing how big He is and how well able He is to help you in your times of need and how ever-present He is to help you any time that you need it. And, and it's just a simple act of just saying, God, you know what? You're bigger than my problems. God, you're bigger than uh, my financial situation. God, you're bigger than this problem or that problem. And all of a sudden, you're focusing on Him. You're magnifying Him. And all of a sudden, you realize that you do have a very strong, very able, and very powerful Daddy. And He's on your side. And when you do that, you magnify the Lord. All of a sudden, you realize He is well able. I don't know if you remember as a child, if you were up with your parents. And I remember... Uh, when I was about four or five years old and uh, my dad would, had fallen asleep on the recliner or the couch or something and I crawled up into his lap and I just kind of put my head up against his chest and he just seemed so so huge, so strong and I could just hear his breathing and his chest is rising up and down and I'm going with it and, and for me it was just something kind of stuck in my head about how really strong my father was. didn't matter that he was asleep and exhausted from work. I just crawled up in his lap, disturbed him but uh, and then other times you know and you're, you're a kid and you're climbing on and you know the your father or your mother, and they lift you up, and they just seem so strong. Why is that? It's because when you're putting your focus on them, you're putting your attention on them, you realize they have that ability to lift you. They have that ability just to seem great to you. Now, when we do that for our Heavenly Father, we're putting our focus on Him, we're magnifying Him, and all of a sudden we realize and we pay attention to the fact He is well able to help us in anything that we need of in our life. Okay, I'm way off my notes, but we're going to go back here again. When you set your eyes on Christ, you put your attention on Him, and everything else uh, around you gets less important. When you magnify Him on top of that, He seems bigger, even though He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Scripture says. Your problems and issues will seem smaller in contrast. God becomes bigger in us, and He can do more with us and through us when we magnify Him and give Him better place in our lives. The word magnify there in the, in the English language anyway. Uh, talks about to enlarge, to boost, to enhance, to maximize, increase, augment, extend, expand, amplify, and intensify. And in the Christian sense, it means to extol, to glorify, praise the Lord, and magnify Him. Now, back to the point earlier just about refocusing. Uh, the description there, the uh, definition for refocus is to adjust the focus of a lens of one's eye. And when you, when you uh, study the human eye, you know the fact that uh, modern camera equipment is kind of mirrored off of a, a great deal of what the human eye does naturally. And one of the things it does, it has the ability to focus on one thing and just make it absolutely sharp and absolutely clear. When you refocus, you have to make your attention stay where it needs to be for as long as possible to make it effective. So take an eye doctor appointment, for example. They show you something to look at, they give you an eye chart, and they say, okay, is this better, is that better? And you have to give feedback, and all of a sudden you can see that your sight's kind of improved at some point. Uh, they help you adjust your vision to keep your eyesight clear and functional. When you and your relationship with God loses focus and you set your gaze elsewhere, you will need to take and make the effort to redirect your gaze on Him. Using the Word and prayer in your study time will help you correct the items that you need to get out of the way so that you'll have a clearest perspective on Christ. Your relationship with Him and what you have to do to keep focus will become clear and effective. And we've got a couple scriptures here we're just going to use to make home the point here. Uh, Isaiah 40, 26, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things that bring us out the host by number. He calls them all by name and the greatness of his might, that he is, for he is strong in power and not one that faileth. John 4, 35 says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then the harvest comes. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look unto the fields, for they are white and ready to the harvest. Now, there's just two scriptures talking about just lifting up your eyes. Now, why is that? We talk about one, and it's talking about setting your focus on God and uh, coming to realize that uh, He's there, He's uh, helping you, and He's, and he's an ever-present time of help and need, uh, ever-present help in times of need. And then there's the next scripture we looked at, and it's just to keep your focus on what we're actually here for. The, the harvest is white and ready, and this was written over 2,000 years ago. How much more so today are people ready to just to hear good news, uh, get out of the lifestyle and the kind of uh, 
uh, repetitive pattern in life so that they're living now and all of a sudden just enter into what God has for them. So we have all these things, this everyday stuff the world kind of puts in our way sometimes, stuff in our way of our vision, things we focus on way too much time on. And the Old Testament, these kind of things, and I'm not talking about the New Testament, I'm talking the Old Testament, these kind of things were blatantly called false idols. And the Old Testament, God repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly said to other uh, uh, nations, they're serving false gods. They, he said to his own nation, to Israel, why do you keep turning your back on me and putting your focus on these other things? And sometimes they'd worship them, and sometimes it would just be things that just kind of took their time away from God. And so here we are now, and we're, we're in the New Testament now. And in the New Testament, it talks about how these things are just literally things that uh, we're spending way too much time on. They're not false gods and false idols in our sense because we already have a relationship. We're adopted back into the kingdom of God. We're not going to lose that position, but we're not focusing on daddy anymore. We're not focusing in our lives and our relationship with him anymore. We're focusing on the day-to-day -day things that come our way. So in the Old Testament, he, he told them time and time and time again, uh, turn your th back on these things and return back to me again. Um, Psalms 44, 20 says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out, for he knows the secrets of the heart. And today's example, we, we're in li living in the days of grace. We're talking about the church age, and God has given us a span just to be able to uh, become one with his family, uh, integrate properly, and adjust to living this new lifestyle, and this, this is what grace is there for. Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We have a span of opportunity, so long as you're sucking oxygen, to, to turn your focus on Him and, and keep this relationship right. We have this opportunity to time and time and time and time again pick ourselves up and focus on our Lord. And that's what grace is there for. Romans 5.21 says, uh, As sin had reigned on earth, even so might grace reign through the righteousness uh, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And Ephesians 2.7 says, that in the ages to come he might show the forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. So even now, God is patiently waiting for us just to come back, sit on his lap, and give our attention to him once more. Refocus on him as your source, your comfort, your help, your guide, your father, your savior, and everything that you have need of, and he will direct your ways to improve your life and your relationship with him. It's that simple. Now, I know these are things I keep talking about every single time we have this class, but communicate with Him, talk with Him, spend time with Him, because if you lose that communication ability, you're going to keep focusing on other things, and you're going to forget to focus on Him, and it's that simple. So, He knows the things that are in the way that make your relationship difficult sometimes. Just like an eye specialist, He'll ask you when things get better. Can you see better now, or how about now? Is, is it, are you doing better now, or how about now? Uh, distinct things, when you when you... Look to him once again, your vision will get clearer. Distinct things will seem close now, distant, sorry. Distant things will seem close now, and close things will seem less significant. Uh, God will help you get 20 20 eyesight for the things in your life when your uh, gaze is fixed on him. Now, what does all this mean? When, when you set your eyes on him, are the problems still there? Absolutely. But when you realize how big and well able he is able to take care of you and anything that you have in the issues of your life, those problems are going to seem less significant up until the fact that you actually realize that the Bible actually talks about casting your cares upon Him. And so if you have issues and problems in your life and they seem so big, put your focus on Him, put your gaze on Him, and those things that just seem like they're attacking you, all of a sudden they're just like, oh, but I think I'm going to be okay. God's kind of dealt with this thing before. Okay, I'm not worried about you anymore, and I'm not worried about you, and oh, well, this is still in my way. Here, uh, Father, can, can you help me carry this? This is really heavy. Oh, oh, you got it. Okay, thank you. And it gets easier and easier and easier to do that. So Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. God has given you this opportunity, this life that we have today, the day and age we live in, to live in grace and reconnect with Him and realize that the problems, what the world throws at you, will not have dominion over you, but you will have dominion over it through Christ Jesus. Redirect. This is the second point for the class this morning. Change anything in your life that does not line up with what you want in your life. Now, unfortunately, sometimes these kind of things sound like self-help uh, classes, and we're not talking about self-help per se. We're talking about you and God helping each other 
uh, particularly him helping you and your relationship with him, your daily life and different issues like that. Yes, some of these points can be taken out and sometimes people have actually written self-help books based just off of scripture, but they're doing it for a secular reason. So I apologize if this sounds like it's a self-help section, but it's really not talking about that. Because all of this, when we're talking about focusing on God, we make sure that He is the center of what we're talking about. It's not, I'll use these steps and this, this action and these motivations and these things will happen in your life. No, when you focus on God and you let Him work on you and in your life, then you realize you're not helping yourself. He's helping you help yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so redirect. Change anything in your life that does not line up with what you want in your life. Now, so we talked earlier, we now have our focus on Him, and at this time, He will begin to talk to you and, uh, about things and see things that get in the way. So for me, at one point in my life, the biggest hindrance between God and me was my own impatience. And I talked about this before, but I had to learn how to trust God that if I'm following Him and pursuing what He's wanting me to do, and He's leading and guiding me step by step of the way, then I have to also learn how to just step back and trust Him that He's leading me in the right way, in the right timing, and just believe that He has my best interest at heart. And so um, I had to learn how to trust Him, uh, that His ways would guide me to where I need to go and the timing that won't hurt me. Uh, that was a big step for me. Other things in my life still seem to pop up from time to time that steals my time away from God. So I counter that. So to counter that, I make time now, uh, every single chance I get, when I get in the car, I'm stopped at red lights, when I'm uh, away from everyone else for a second or two, I take those times and those opportunities to spend just a moment or two with Him, keep my connection fresh, keep my focus set on Him, but trust me, we will always keep finding things in our lives that get in the way. Take time to locate where you are, what things get in the way, and you and God can work together on these things to get them corrected. It gets easier when you know it's for your benefit. Now, I'm not harping on any situation, but let's just say, for example, uh, in the past, before you became a Christian, you were a drug addict for whatever reason. And all of a sudden, you realize that, okay, now you're a Christian, and God's actually telling you, you know, that's bad for you. Don't do that. Just like a good, loving father would, you know, you're reaching for something you're not supposed to do, and you're like, what was that? It's because He loves you. He's correcting you. Now, I'm not talking about that. It's kind of an extreme example, but there's other things in our life um, that just seem to steal away our time when we could just be spending it with God. And that's what church is great for. So we come together, we worship together, we fellowship together, and we all set our focus on God together. But yet, there's still people that, uh, given the opportunity, they'd rather just stay at home. And I was almost one of those people this morning. When your body's aching and you're tired or it's cold and your bed is all nice and toasty and warm, and you're like, oh, you know what, I can go next time or I can go next time. And you have to realize church isn't about a religious thing. You have to be there every single time the doors are open. It's about an opportunity to come together and fellowship with other people that are just going through life, just like you are, who are going to strengthen each other, encourage each other, and take these times just to focus on God and spend time with the Lord. So uh, for me, and for something I'm just going to point out to yourselves as well, learn to trust God. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Now, why is this important? The Bible talks about how we're walking the straight and narrow path of, of salvation. It's a, it's a path that God has put in front of us. It talks about how uh, He's directing us, He's leading us, He's guiding us. The, the Scriptures actually talk about how He's already walked this path ahead of us, so He already knows the way we're supposed to go. It also talks about how He's with us, and we'll hear a voice behind us say, go this way or go this way. And uh, it also talks about how uh, we're His sheep, and His sheep hear His voice, and a stranger's voice we, we will not follow. And so we're walking this path, but we still have to learn how to trust Him that He's not leading us astray. He's going to lead us exactly where we need to go. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, how He's going to lead us beside still waters with grass and uh, 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 good vegetation to eat, just like we're sheep, and we are sheep, and He's our good shepherd, and He knows the best places in life for us, the best way to go, and He's going to get us there. So when you enter into a relationship with someone, one of the biggest and most difficult steps is learning to trust them. You have to learn to trust them uh, with who you really are, not just the mask that we all tend to wear in front of other people sometimes. God knows you, the real you. Learn to be yourself, but also know that He will lead you and guide you to be the best you that you can be. Now, that again, sounds kind of self-helpy and, and all this New Age kind of stuff, but uh, I'll use myself as an example. I know when I'm not right with God, and this is just me personally speaking, when I look at myself in the mirror, I almost hear and feel that inner conviction of the Holy Spirit saying, you know, just take that step and 
get right again. And I know when I'm serving God, like I have been these last few months and continually just serving God and uh, being able to teach and preach, and I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do with my life, I love looking myself in the eyes again. And I just see that's the real me, the one that God is molding and shaping to be the, that man of God that He wants me to be. And He does the same thing for all of us. You know, and if you can't look at yourself in the eyes and like what you see sometimes, that's what the great thing is about God is He is there to help you know He sees you perfect already. He's not judging you. He's not condemning you. But He's encouraging you because He knows the potential of who you are and what you can be on this life because He put it in you. So, learn to be yourself, but also know that He will lead you and guide you to be the best you that you can be, but also know that He loves you just the way you are. Uh, we say that even about people that we're trying to witness to and help bring into salvation. You don't have to change a thing. Be you, but come to God knowing that you need Him. And then He will sit there and go, hey, you know what, this needs to change and this needs to change, but, you know, I love you. And we'll work on it together, okay? Okay. It's just like a loving parent would do. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A relationship of trust will grow into a relationship of knowing that he knows what is best, and little by little you will become more Christ-like. Because ultimately that's what the Scriptures actually tell us we're supposed to be doing with our lives. Now, this part gets a little more difficult, but this talks about how the Bible, the Word of God, is a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The connotation here is that the Word of God can cut us right to where we really live, the very heart of the matter. Um, the idea ultimately suggests that it's almost like a scalpel helping remove what is not good in our lives and helping us heal and recover after we are injured and seeking refuge. Psalms 91.2 says, I will save the Lord. He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Mark 2.17 says, When Jesus heard it, He said to them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Exodus 15.26 uh, and said that if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of thy uh, Lord thy God, and will do which is right in His sight, and will give ear to His commandments, and keep His statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord which healeth thee. And this is just a few examples about how in the Scripture, how you realize that uh, God is there to help, not to hinder, and all you have to do is just listen to the basic things He's asking you to do. Why? Is he going to put sickness on you like he did to the Egyptians? No, it's not what that's saying in the Old Testament. If you look in the Old Testament, it actually talks about is when they stepped out of line, when God said do one thing and they did another, the enemy was able to attack them. That's what happened to the Egyptians. So this two-edged sword. This uh, two-edged sword actually becomes part of us ultimately. When we learn the Word of God, it becomes part of us. Uh, we can use it to help others. And this double edge comes sometimes as we're even teaching. Even this morning me talking or sharing with others, what God, God can and do uh, for other people, at those times we will often realize that something we needed to hear for ourselves as well. Have you ever done that? You've just been talking to people and all of a sudden you realize you're just encouraging yourself at the same time, God did this for me in the past and He'll do it for you, and all of a sudden some little problem that was really kind of irking you and attacking you, and all of a sudden you realize, you know what, God's going to do it again for me because He's trustworthy and He's done it in the past and He's faithful. And you realize that you're just helping encourage this one person, you know, just, just hang in there just a little bit longer and keep that faith and don't let go because God will do it. And all of a sudden you realize this problem that was kind of attacking you has just kind of gotten a little less attacky because you realize you can just hand it over to God and you realize He's going to come through for you time and time and time again. So how many times have we heard a preacher or a teacher share something that God has put on their heart and it's also something that just kind of hits us right where we live at the same time. Why is that? When we come to know that the Word of God and that it's alive and it's active in all of us, the very act of sharing the Word with others activates its ability to work greater in our own lives. We remember when it was uh, the first time we heard a scripture and we remember that God answered a prayer that we forgot about or suddenly know that God will do for us just as He always has done for us. Okay, we're just going to redirect here. Back to the point again. When you redirect something. Uh, Psalms 5.3 My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord, 
and the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Isaiah 45, 13. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all of his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall uh, let go my captives, not for a price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. When you redirect something, you change the path of the direction of something to use for something in a different purpose. Isaiah 30, 21. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. So, when you redirect something, and in, in the example we're going to talk about just in, in just a minute, but when you redirect something, you're actually re-steering it into a different course, re-steering it in a different direction than it was going before. Now, for us, I don't know about you, but I didn't serve God all of my life. I served me most of my life. Even though I was in school and I had all these other ambitions, it would be what I wanted to do in life, I realized I was serving me and not Him. And so when you become a Christian, all of a sudden you realize there's a better path instead of this rocky, bumpy path that uh, we kind of steer ourselves on sometimes, and you realize that the straight and narrow path is there because it's actually the easier way to go. God knows the best way to get the best results in your life for you, and it's on that straight and narrow path. And then He's just going to redirect your, guide, uh, your steps and guide you back to where you need to go. And that's what... Uh, uh, a relationship with God is actually really good for us because He will know the best way for you to, to walk, to what to do, what to eat, when to go, when not to go. Uh, I've used the example before when I was over in Ireland, myself and my wife, we had money to come over for a vacation, and both of us just knew in our inner man, don't go. It wasn't the right time or something, or there might have been an issue, this, that, and the other with immigration later on in life. I don't know. But we both knew in our spirit, man, that God just says, nope, you, you don't need to go this time. And for whatever reason, we said, okay, Lord, we're just going to trust you. We're going to uh, not take this step, and we're not going to go, and we felt like we should go. And other times, we're walking in, and we love everybody in the town we came from in Dundalk, Ireland, but there's uh, kind of a, a few rough areas, and there's times the Holy Spirit just kind of said, go that way, not that way, and we go that way. And uh, Juliet would look at me sometimes. She goes, you heard that too? And I said, yep, we're going to go this way. And just there wasn't, It was a brighter street sometimes. We'd walk down darker alleys sometimes, and just to get away from wherever the Holy Spirit just says, don't go that way. It's safer for you, and it's better to just go this way. And so we'd, we'd, we'd answer and just say, okay, Lord. And we, we took steps. And other times when we're in the midst of the worst situation, and uh, there was one time that there was a whole bunch of youth, and they literally attacked the man that was walking just 10, 15 feet in front of me, you know, took his wallet and all this other stuff, and, you know, what do you got? Give me, give me smokes. You got anything to drink? Give me your money. Give me your money. And I'll, they swarmed this one guy, and I'm like, okay, God, what do I do? And he says, keep on walking. Be fine. And they didn't even, literally, they did not even look at me, didn't even glance my direction. They completely accosted the guy in front of me, and they ignored me. But why is that? Well, sometimes God also has supernatural protection, and He knows when uh, uh, you need to just take steps of faith and just learn how to trust Him. And so these are the things we need to learn in this relationship that we have with Him. Okay, we're going to wrap up here. We're last two pages here. Um, the very act of having accepted Christ in the first place is the biggest act of redirection in a person's life ever. To acknowledge that you need to turn around and start afresh a clean slate is a big step. Why is it so hard then for us to realize that in your relationship with God, if it's not where it needs to be, the very act of redirection is still available to you and it's very easy. The only requirement is that you, uh, is the knowledge that you want to change, try to change, work at the change until you get back to the point where you want to be with God and you'll work at it until you can maintain and then grow from there. The Bible talks about how you'll go from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with an open face beholding in a glass the, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as the Spirit of the Lord. Now, just to point out a few couple things there, we're looking at the Word. The Word is our glass. When we look at God and He's, He's showing us that we're going to change into His image more and more. And we change there by the Word of God, and then there's also the, the last little hint there. It talks about the Spirit of God. God's Spirit in us is going to help us change, keep on track our, our relationship with Him so that we can get there glory to glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's it for today.